It might be hard to believe, but we're coming up to a year since both Sony and Microsoft launched their respective consoles. Despite the hardware shortages, the Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 have sold extremely well. And Nintendo, well, they've released a refresh of sorts with the Switch OLED. It's basically the same specifications in terms of hardware, but obviously we do see a nice screen upgrade, which is great if you play the console a lot in portable mode. But there's an obvious question. What is next? If you're running a copy of Windows 10, which isn't activated, of course, not only do you have to worry about the missing customization options, but there's also that annoying Windows desktop watermark reminding you to activate. Today's video is sponsored by whokeys.com, and they have an excellent price on Windows 10 Professional, as well as home keys. Yeah, and they also, of course, sell games. I've bought a few Windows 10 keys with my own personal account to test everything was legit and worked in preparation for this sponsored video. You can pick up one of their keys for 25% off using the coupon code RGT in the checkout. There's links to their website in the video description. Also, if you're building a few systems, there's bundles available too. Again, you can check out whokeys.com and use the coupon code RGT for 25% off the listed Windows 10 key prices. Will Microsoft release an Xbox Series XX XL? Pro, let me know what you guys think is going to be the name of the upgraded mid-generation refresh of the Xbox. And as for Sony, what about the PS5 Pro? Well, yeah, my sources have been telling me some very interesting things regarding both of these console manufacturers. And furthermore, I also have a small update concerning the Switch as well, and I want to start with that first. A small caveat, of course, any information can be wrong. But a couple of sources have actually been really accurate in the past. I don't want to attribute certain stories to certain people. But yeah, I'm pretty confident at least some of this information as of the time I'm recording this is correct. With that said, let's start out with the Switch. I was actually the first, or one of the first anyway, to say that Nintendo were working on a more powerful updated version of the Switch hardware. Basically, at the time, I was just calling it the Switch 4K, but of course, that was not the official name of the console. One of the primary things regarding this Switch hardware was that it was utilizing NVIDIA's DLSS technology and was targeting a 4K output. Obviously, updated hardware was the aim of the the game here, not only in terms of hardware specifications, but a later and greater architecture. And Switch, Switch 4K, Switch 2, whatever Nintendo ends up calling this thing, I think is inevitable. After all, the Switch now is getting a little old, not just in terms of the date it was released, but also in terms of the physical capabilities of the device. Gamers are increasingly adopting 4K screens, and with Microsoft and Sony, Microsoft in particular, pushing 120 hertz for many of its titles, well, yeah, Nintendo can get some mileage out of the fact that titles like Metroid Dread look pretty nice in terms of their art style, but there's only a certain amount you can do to make up for the sheer depth of pixels that are being pushed onto a 4K screen. Therefore, it does make sense, particularly when you also consider that the Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 are also going to be really pushing games, which quite frankly will not really transition too well to Switch hardware. Think about it for a moment, it won't be too long in the future when we start to see games utilizing Unreal Engine 4. We've already seen some fast insights not just because of course Epic themselves have released various demos of UE5 but well now it's available in beta form. The technologies such as Nanite and Lumen are well very impressive and let's be honest games are going to really benefit from it. The wimpy uh, CPU, GPU and lack of memory bandwidth in, time, in terms of the Switch well, we've seen really impressive things from games like Doom being ported onto the Switch, but there is only a certain amount that you can uh, strain out of the hardware. So last year, I also had been further told by yet another source that there were definitely development kits in the hands of internal uh, Nintendo testers. And to my knowledge, these kits were in early EVT stages of bringing up new hardware. But these kits basically just seem to disappear. But to be clear, we're not referring to Switch OLED. Nintendo has denied the existence of new hardware a number of times now, or at least upgraded hardware, including on Twitter. One of my sources, though, told me the messaging of these denials from Nintendo has been very careful. 
essentially stating things, and I'm paraphrasing here, like the Switch Pro or Switch 4K doesn't exist because they're not going to end up calling it that, and the fact that they're not planning to release new hardware but focused on the OLED, which again makes sense because this release is not anytime soon. Others have already said a lot of this new hardware, but I am leaning towards the system not being an upgrade. Think, for example, with a Microsoft analogy, Xbox One to Xbox One X. Instead, continuing with our Microsoft example, it would be Xbox One X to Xbox Series X. Probably still the same underlying technology, i.e. they will continue with NVIDIA, of course, but they will have much more update updated excuse me, architecture, and almost certainly the system will be backwards compatible. And almost certainly this hardware will be backwards compatible. Some games just will not work on the older hardware. Nintendo have done this previously, for example, with their uh, handheld lineups, so it makes sense. I don't believe that this system will launch anytime soon. We've already seen numerous rumours that the system is going to launch late 2022 in the earliest. And an interesting thing here is I'm told that NVIDIA's DLSS 3 is a sure thing to launch next year. I am getting mixed messages whether or not DLSS 3 is going to be for the launch of the RTX 40, which is said to be Q3 or Q4 2022, according to my sources and numerous others on the internets. But what I am told is that DLSS 3 does exist by two to three sources, and two of which have been very accurate previously. I've already discussed DLSS 3 uh, previously in a video, I'll link to it if I remember to in the description, but I do wonder if DLSS 3 is a requirement for the Switch, or more accurately, Nintendo feel that it's of paramount importance because of visual quality improvements and other stuff that, again, I've discussed in that previous video. I want to be clear, this is not something that my sources have told me, that it's going to use DLSS 3 for the Switch, or upgraded Switch, or whatever it ends up being called, but it does make a level of sense, especially given the fact that, let's say, a Switch 2, well, Nintendo will be releasing this when the adoption rate of 4K screens is just ridiculously high. Nintendo's art doesn't necessarily require the latest or greatest hardware. After all, their games are very artistic looking. Look what they did with, say, Metroid Dread. It's got excellent art direction, but even so, the Maxwell hardware in the system is starting to look quite long in the tooth. This is to say nothing of ports from the PS5 and Series X in the future, as UE5 and other game engines become standard and just demands of the hardware are ever higher. Developers are already porting uh, games like Doom, of course, and they have worked miracles to do so, and there's other more modern examples. But there is only a certain amount they can do with the limited bandwidth and CPU performance, for example, which it's just limiting the hardware compared to, let's say, the Xbox series of systems from uh, Microsoft. Speaking of Microsoft, I've been told by two separate people that Microsoft are currently in the early planning stages to figure out what they want to do and what their next move will be. I suspect Microsoft, if they do go with a mid-generation refresh, and my guess is they probably will, and we'll get to why in a second, it will probably have a T-flop advantage over the PlayStation 5 Pro, though T-flops aren't everything, and again, we'll get to this in a moment. I have been told, though, by two separate people now, Microsoft is basically wanting to see what Sony does and then outdo them. Now, this is not to say that Microsoft don't actually have uh, kind of experiments or testing hardware internally they are but they're basically trying to figure out what Sony's next move is and also the performance targets for example they're trying to decide well are Sony going to just go straight to the PS6 uh, what type of release date are Sony aiming for and so on and so on and this in well tech and gaming is nothing new AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, all companies, like even Sam, you know, Samsung, Apple, they all try to do this. It's just, well, it's just part of the, you know, ebbing and the tides. But Microsoft, you know, if you've been following history for any length of time, you'll know that they did this with the Xbox One X. It largely outperformed the 
PlayStation 4 Pro, for example, it had more powerful a GPU, it had a higher CPU clock, and perhaps most importantly, had more memory. One area that Microsoft did lose out to though with Sony in that refresh cycle was that Sony did customize their GPU, incorporating later technology into it. What do I mean? Well, the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X's GPU largely anyway were based on Polaris, so there were a couple of generations ahead of their launch consoles. But Sony did push for customization into its GPU and added things like Rapid Packed Math, which was from AMD's Vega architecture. Vega launched about a year later on, uh, on PC desktop after Polaris. Rapid Packed Math allowed two half-precision operations to run concurrently on, on a shader at once. So basically it was a major speed up. By the way, RPM, if you're unfamiliar, allows two operations of half-precision to run on a shader at once. So that would be FP16. You can run two instructions rather than just a single FP32. This was a major speed up in some graphics operations, although, of course, the mileage does also vary on a game engine by game engine basis as well. My guess is, though, that Microsoft would want to drastically increase the performance over the Xbox Series X. There's just no point in Microsoft releasing the console. They feel that the X name, you know, this, this hardware has to have a major leap. It's just part of the DNA that Microsoft have now for its consoles. And I don't have specifics, I don't have hardware specs or targets, as again, I'm being told they are basically deciding what their next move is. They are carefully analyzing feedback that developers are providing them over the Xbox series of consoles to improve their SDKs of their current systems, and of course to incorporate improvements on the next generation. And we will get more into specifics in just a moment, but let's talk about the PlayStation 5, or rather the PS5 Pro, as I have most information about this. Well, I do have the most information regarding the PlayStation 5, Pro. In fact, two sources have actually given me pretty similar information and they've got no ties to one another. Now, what I will say is that one of the sources has been pretty accurate in the past with other things, but mostly pertaining to PC-related topics, such as NVIDIA's upcoming RTX 40 series, RDNA 3 from AMD, and also Intel's GPU and CPU plan. With that said, A, that is again pertaining to uh, PC side of things and B again any information can be wrong but what I will say is the information that they have given me seems to have panned out and others on the internet seems to have somewhat confirmed given the products aren't actually released yet what I have said in a few times regarding these topics and furthermore a third source has kind of hinted that uh, this might be actually accurate, but they haven't provided any exact clarification as to the specifications. With those caveats out of the way, let's talk about the PS5 Pro. Again, you can take this with a level of salt, and we'll get more into why in just a second, but I am told that the PlayStation 5 Pro is real. A third source has also given me a little context as well, but again, this stuff is years out. So plans and targets can and probably will change. And secondly, anything and everyone can be wrong. I've literally been given official press briefings before by companies, I won't say who, and then amendments email to me to explain that the price or other information they've given is wrong. For example, the embargo date or even specifications. Heck, I've even been given hardware by one company before to review and then just as I'm about to publish the review, I'm told don't publish the review because the hardware that we've given you is actually out of date and we're about to release a new line of PC hardware. No, I'm not kidding. So either way, with the caveats out of the way, the PlayStation 5 Pro is currently targeting a late 2023 launch, possibly slipping to 2024. Sony apparently do want to aim for the earlier launch window though, and I have been told that prior to the launch of the PS5 Pro, we'll see the slim. I've already made a video on this, but I'm told it's possibly 2022, probably though it might see a slip to 2023. Either way, it's gonna be on TSMC's 5NM process. The slim though is nothing new. It's not really that much to talk about. It's just a smaller console, really. It's created on TSMC's 5NM process, which should mean it generates less heat in its sock, 
and this would allow Sony to go cheaper on cooling components, casing can be shrunk down, power supply slash VRM and other stuff inside the console could also be dialed back, such as say fewer phases for the VRM solution, possibly, and so on and so on. I won't really talk about this further, as it's basically the same as the PS4 Slim, PS3 Slim, Xbox uh, 360 Slim, you get the point. It's the same principle, same design, performance targets, but the console's just, uh, well, slimmer. I'm sure everyone watching this could guess that Sony would do this for the PlayStation 5, so I don't really feel that there's any further uh, information I need to give you guys. The PlayStation 5 Pro, though, this is the interesting part. I don't have specifications yet of the hardware, but I do have early performance targets. Sony's apparently aiming for a two times increase in performance over the base PS5, but RT performance is apparently higher than this, about 2.5 times over the base PS5. Now, as you can imagine, the console will have better ray tracing effects, it could run higher resolution and or frame rates, and developers, of course, making the ultimate decision here. Speculation only, but I imagine Sony will not drastically increase the memory capacity to something like 64 gigabytes or possibly even 32. Memory is actually quite expensive, honestly, and I don't think it's gonna be changing, especially as we start to introduce newer standards like GDDR7 and 6X is not exactly super cheap either. I would imagine that a smaller memory upgrade Possibly 20 or 24 gigabytes at most is possible. This would potentially give Sony a wider memory bus too, which could lead to extra bandwidth to feed all of this additional performance and power, but without knowledge of the memory type in use, currently they're using GDDR6 on a 256-bit bus, well, yeah, it doesn't really mean much because we don't have the uh, clock frequency of the memory, meaning the bus width, it, you can't work anything out. But basically speaking, the Xbox Series and PlayStation 5 have ultra-fast SSDs, so this means that data can be refreshed really fast in main memory. Even so, higher quality visuals would mean developers would probably like extra RAM. I can speculate that we'll see speed improvements for the PlayStation 5 and a pro Xbox as well, but I stress this is speculation. What is super interesting though is that I'm being told Sony is pushing improvements on reconstruction technology. Sony tends to work a little differently to Microsoft in tackling problems, preferring to go leaner with its design. The PlayStation 5 is already pretty narrow in design, only 36 active CU, instead running the clock frequency really high to get high data throughput. So going ultra wide and having a ton of CPU cores probably wouldn't be the direction that Sony would want to go. It's against the established direction of the PlayStation 5 already. This is speculation, but I suspect Sony will take their strategy of the PS4 Pro, make a console with more power, yes, but leverage advanced upsampling technology to improve things further. Again, I've had sources told, tell me that Sony will head in this direction almost certainly, but no specs as yet. Microsoft's DirectML is a very cool solution for machine learning, and while DirectML can easily be lumped into upsampling only, it really isn't accurate, and honestly, it is actually underselling DirectML, as it can be used for a plethora of things, including AI. I suspect Sony will probably not go this route necessarily, in other words, their version of direct ML exactly, but instead bespoke methods of improving visual quality for upsampling. How this is achieved, and whether it's through machine learning, an evolution of checkerboard rendering, something entirely different, or a combination of factors, I don't know yet. AMD's FSR is widely embraced by Microsoft too. In fact, it's part of the SDK. It's a spatial upscaler, essentially using Lancho's scaler with two passes. For those interested in this, I worked on a video about it with AMD. I'll put a link in the video description. So the thing about FSR is that it doesn't utilize things like motion vectors, which are basically previous uh, frames of animation, so it can figure out how objects are moving. Now, I'm, all, I'm pretty sure that AMD is working on FSR 2, and I am told it's a lot more advanced than FSR 1, 
probably taking motion vectors into account. Again, these are the movement of objects from previous frames, and it does make uh, upsampling a lot more accurate. Given the work that Intel's XESS, which is their kind of variant of DLSS, and of course NVIDIA's DLSS, I wouldn't be surprised if Sony is embracing a cheaper solution as to what we see here. And by cheaper solution, I mean in terms of how long it takes to calculate the upsampling portion of one frame to another. As again, while it does save you frames to upsample from let's say 1440p to reconstruct to 4K, the reconstruction portion still takes time. So the more efficient and fast you can make that, you still spit out more frames. I've been also told by another very reliable source that Sony will be embracing the PC a lot in the future, and we'll be getting a lot more ports from the PlayStation to PC. I'm not the only one who said this, numerous other folks on the internet have said this already, and we've already seen God of War, of course, confirm to use DLSS from NVIDIA. But I'm told that Sony are going to be working alongside NVIDIA quite a lot in the future for many of its ports. Now, this is speculation on my part. I really want to stress that. But I do wonder if Sony's teams are using DLSS and basically trying to figure out how their engines can be adjusted and altered to, for example, understand best practices to incorporate upsampling such as DLSS in their engines. And maybe this is the direction Sony will go. I stress these are my words based on the fact that I've been told by a source that Sony are going to be working alongside NVIDIA quite a lot and really using DLSS. So this is not a leak. I just want to stress that. However, it is very safe to assume that Microsoft and Sony's upgraded ninth generation hardware, assuming it does get released, will stick with AMD. There's literally no reason for them not to do this, given AMD's robust roadmap and also backwards compatibility being so important for both Microsoft and Sony, especially Microsoft. Looking at the roadmap of the CPU and GPUs of AMD, there's both RDNA 3 and Zen 4 on the horizon, and possibly even RDNA 4 and Zen 5 if the consoles release far enough into the future. Zen 4 and RDNA 3 are thought to release on the desktop probably late 2022, and rumour is that we'll see RDNA 4 and Zen 5 probably launch about a year later. This would basically be late 2023, although some are saying it could be 2024. Whether or not Sony would embrace this technology, RDNA 3 for example and Zen 4, we don't know. Looking at the previous consoles, the Xbox One X and PlayStation 4 Pro, they retain the same 8-core Jaguar processors, albeit Sony ramped up clock frequencies, and Microsoft did do some architectural tweaking to Jaguar to improve performance. Although they didn't fully disclose what, they also, in addition to all of this, ramped up the clock frequencies. Actually, more than Sony did. Tweaks to the CPU architecture for the next generation of consoles, well, honestly, there are dozens of ways Sony or Microsoft could go, but I highly doubt they would fundamentally change the mission or design of their console. What do I mean by this? Well, one example is that Sony tweaked the CPU to really focus on game performance, nerfing certain floating point operations, for example, AVX code, in favor of leveraging compute instructions instead on the GPU and making other small changes on the CPU to improve game performance. I suspect they'll continue this for the PlayStation 5 Pro. I also don't see it very likely that Sony or Microsoft will increase the number of CPU cores. It's a lot of extra work for developers. It's faster and more efficient. That's the direction I think that Sony and Microsoft would logically go, at least in my personal opinion. A big thing though for RDNA 3 are numerous fundamental changes in the actual underlying architecture of the GPU. Now this is not such a big change as what we're going to be seeing with RDNA 4. I'm told RDNA 4 is, well, let's just say extremely different, whereas RDNA 3 is a big evolution over RDNA 2. I've spoken about RDNA 3 a few times on the channel already, and now other leakers have seemingly heard pretty much the same. But in a nutshell, the compute unit design for RDNA is pretty much gone. So with RDNA 1 and later, 
There were basically workgroup processors. These were essentially two compute units clumped together, but with RDNA 3, they are basically just tossed out and now we have clumps of shaders. The last I heard, and I posted on this channel already, which others now seemingly are kind of echoing, the top end RDNA 3 SKU is sporting over 15,000 shaders, and it could be running at around 75 teflops of performance. To put this into some level of context, the 6900 XT from AMD, which is the current flagship for desktop, is around 25 teflops. This will be achieved for RDNA 3 via chiplets with two graphics chiplets known as GCD and a single MCD, which is thought to be a cache, basically an evolution of infinity cache that we have for desktop. I've also heard that RDNA 3 for the highest end SKU will have 240 RT units. Basically, AMD are affording Microsoft and Sony a ton of flexibility and options for its GPU. And really, it's going to come down to how much the team want to leverage it in terms of balancing heat, power consumption, yields of the chip, and of course, well, cost. Ultimately, Sony would not want to code the 15,000 shader route for its console, but they do have a ton of options. TSMC's 5NM process will be extremely mature by the time we see these consoles launch, even if we see them launch in the early 2023 timeframe, and I don't think it's going to be that early because it's late 2023 is what I'm hearing. TSMC's free NM process will also enter mass production, uh, kind of Q1, Q2, 2023. And here on Anantech, you can see a nice handy dandy chart of how each process compares to the previous. Basically speaking, there's a huge density improvement and power reduction from 7 to 3 nm, or even 7 to 5. Worth noting, though, that volume production of 16 nm started mid-2015 from TSMC, and of course, Sony and Microsoft both use these variants for their respective SOCs. Another interesting thing that some people are talking about is the experimentation which AMD are doing for additional cache on chip in the form of vCache. Now, AMD have been showing Ryzen vCache, which is going to be on the AM4 platform, going to launch uh, early next year, as actually a massive speed up. This extra clump of cache apparently increases game performance by about 15%. However, and again, this is speculative on my part, I don't think we're going to see this incorporated in a console because quite honestly, it would just be a lot of additional cost in terms of manufacturing for a kind of a, a modest speed up. There's a lot of other ways they could get that additional performance by just, just tweaking the current caches on the chips or whatever. The key takeaways though, Nintendo, I'm pretty sure that they are already working on a new console. Let's face it, you can expect that. The Switch is already several years old at this point, but I don't think it's a pro model Switch how I initially had heard it. In fact, I believe it's almost certainly more like a new generation. So think instead of Xbox One to Xbox One X, again, it's probably Xbox Series X over Xbox One. Microsoft are currently experimenting with different approaches, and I think they will launch later than Sony. I suspect they will probably end up with a more powerful console, but again, all of this is speculation. I do think, though, that logically speaking, they are definitely playing a wait-and-see game, because honestly, Microsoft are doing pretty well at the moment. Despite the fact that they are being outsold by Sony, they are certainly not struggling, and they're even doing better in Japan than perhaps they have have been historically plus also obviously they're pushing really heavily in the pc market it's going to be very interesting to see how the pc market unfolds for both sony and microsoft in the longer term and as for sony the playstation 5 pro is apparently going to launch in late 2023 this makes sense given the time frame difference between the ps4 and the ps4 pro's launch as well and again as i mentioned earlier about a two times faster traditional rasterization improvement and about 2.5 times for rt it should also be noted though that well targets can change based on yields and clocks a great example if gpu clocks are better than initially thought. For example, we could see an extra 100 megahertz. This could easily increase performance. We saw Microsoft crank the clock frequency of the Xbox 
one CPU and GPU last minute before launch because their chip simply had more room left in the tank. Also, in early testing and simulation, reality can be quite different. We might be getting early simulation results or just internal targets by Sony, and these two things are quite different. Remember, RDNA 3 was said to be 2.5 times faster than RDNA 2, and instead it's looking to be 2.8, possibly even higher. NVIDIA's Lovelace RTX 40 was initially thought to be two times faster than RTX 30, more specifically the 1390, aka Ampere, but those targets are also no longer correct. It seems instead that Ampere could be outperformed by Lovelace closer to around 2.4 times. I don't think Sony is going to brute force their approach though, likely experimenting with efficiency and performance improvements. Of course, T-flops will increase, but T-flops are not the best measurement of performance from one generation to another. So there you go, guys. That's what I've been hearing about all three next-generation consoles. I think it will be fascinating, honestly, to see what happens regarding a mid-generation refresh, because, honestly, there is a lot of options on the table for both Microsoft and Sony compared to the previous generation. So when we look at the PlayStation 4 Pro and Xbox One X, there was technically speaking an option, especially for Microsoft, given they were releasing their console later, to have gone with the first generation of Zen products. But really and truly, there were a lot of things that were kind of against that. One of those was backwards compatibility. And quite frankly, Microsoft and Sony now have a lot more options in terms of the roadmap. I think that fundamentally, we're going to see a system which kind of follows the same path as what we saw with the previous mid-generation upgrades, later GPU architecture, more memory bandwidth. But I do believe that efficiency is going to be the name of the game here for both Sony and Microsoft. Moving to the 5 or 3 NM process is going to afford Sony or Microsoft a lot of additional flexibility in building a more powerful chip, of course, as we were discussing just a moment ago regarding the comparisons between TSMC's different nodes. But at the end of the day, they still need to balance things like, well, cost of production. And given at the moment we are not exactly certain how the yields will be for the free NM process, for example, from TSMC, it's going to be a fascinating balancing act, I think. I'll also be very curious when we start to hear rumors of the next generation consoles, which I guess will be the 10th generation. It'll be very interesting to me whether Sony and Microsoft still stick with AMD or whether they will go a different direction. But with that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. If you have enjoyed it, you know the stuff to do. Click subscribe, of course, if you're not already a subscriber to the channel, and also click the likey button. With that said, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.